Good afternoon, class. I'm a little later than I expected to be uh, putting together the screencast to carry us through what I had hoped to cover in class today uh, to set us up for a relatively fresh start tomorrow, talking about classical era ancient Greece. Uh, so today we are focusing primarily on the Archaic period, that period following the Greek quote-unquote Dark Ages, which as I mentioned in class, really sets the stage for um, much of what follows in the classical uh, period of ancient Greek history, uh, a time when democracy comes into something close to full flower, uh, when we see the philosophical and intellectual breakthroughs that the ancient Greeks are perhaps best known for. Uh, so today I just I wanted to in, in making my finishing uh, comments, I wanted to go back and remind you of the day's objectives. And uh, here they are, and uh, we'll continue on. Uh, we made it through most of this slide, but I do want to just say, oops, I'll go back. I just want to say one more thing here. Uh, we talked about how the polis, or the polis, the plural of polis, really came to uh, came into focus during this archaic period of roughly 750 to 500 or so BCE. And the polis is really an important institution and it's on the polis that that democratic structure of the political and social landscape of Greece is going to be set. So this is, this is really important. Now what's interesting about the polis, and I sort of made at least a, a, a brief effort at suggesting that our very own Walla Walla, in some ways, our civic culture and our civic setting is something somewhat reminiscent of the ancient Greek polis. And all I meant to suggest there was that uh, individual Walla Wallans, sort of like individuals in archaic Greece, of course with the important clarification that by individual we mean males who are fairly well off and whose uh, families go back generations within, let's say, Athens as, as the given city-state. Uh, individuals in ancient Greece could influence their community and its conduct and the decisions that are reached, the issues that are discussed, in a fairly impressive way. Far more so than, say, other parts of the civilized world uh, during the ancient Greek experiment. So they were somewhat unique. I guess you could say just like the ancient Hebrews take a polytheistic world and bring to it a monotheism, uh, so it is that the ancient Greeks during this archaic period take from a largely uh, autocratic world where most parts of the civilized world are being governed by a king and they add something far more democratic. This begins with the polis. The one drawback that we might say exists with the polis is that it does create instability because bear in mind these uh, city-states where these polis are in place uh, can be quite competitive with one another. Uh, they perhaps perceive that their own well-being and their future destiny is built upon uh, their succeeding at the expense of nearby or rival uh, city-states throughout the Greek peninsula. So the instability is that sort of this fierce patriotism and even some of these values of courage and honor put forward by a person like Homer well, sometimes that courage and honor is being carried out against one's rivals in nearby city-states. So it had an, ins an unstable um, expression that oftentimes reared its head. Okay? Now, while the polis is essentially helping to expand the individual and you know, take steps towards democracy, uh, in our reading for today when we were talking about Cleisthenes, we realize that democracy doesn't really reach its fuller expression until a little bit later, but this archaic period is sort of is, is helping to set the lay the lay the foundation or the groundwork for that. Militarily, we see another breakthrough or innovation that's taking place in Greece during the archaic period as well, and that is what had once but been uh, a largely aristocratic military, where individuals from some of the more well-to-do and more accomplished families 
would fight sort of cavalry style on horseback against their rivals or counterparts from other city-states. We're starting to see, just as the polis has some democratic elements to it, we're starting to see a similar dem democratization take place in the militaries of ancient Greece. And this is evident in a couple of developments. First off, we have the uh, hoplites themselves. The hoplites were the ancient Greek soldiers, and we're going to see a switch from cavalry to infantry. So as this little um, depiction here suggests, these are going to be largely foot soldiers, but you can tell that these foot soldiers have a fair amount of gear that they use. And in ancient Greece, during the Archaic period, and it's also true going back centuries before that, it would have been the individual soldier who would be responsible for outfitting himself for battle. So right there you see that there is an element of class affiliation associated with uh, fighting in the Greek military. So if you couldn't afford a helmet, if you couldn't afford a shield, if you didn't have um, your uh, spear or your sword that you would have worn in a belt around your waist, you wouldn't have been really eligible to contribute or participate in the military. And not only that, there's also the whole issue of training, right? Are you trained in the martial arts? It's not enough just to have the gear, you also have to know what to do with it. So that may sound in some ways like, oh, well, that's a that's a good deal for the lower class people. That means they don't have to serve. Well, you might also ask the question, what does that mean when one city-state defeats a rival city-state? Who do you think benefits from the spoils of war and who who is able to benefit from the opportunities made available by that victory? It would have been, by and large, the uh, upper level of society. So by the archaic period, we're starting to see that process become more democratic. Uh, granted, you still had to have some wealth to be able to outfit yourself and equip yourself for military service. But now what you've seen is that serving in the military doesn't require quite as much. You don't have to have a horse. You don't have to have quite as much gear. You do still need a shield. You need a helmet. You need um, your swords, your spears, what have you. But the threshold or the obstacles to participating become less. And as a result, the military itself becomes more democratic. Uh, also, the way in which the hoplite fought, they fought in a phalanx formation, which, as your textbook suggests, involved them working in really tight formations that were oftentimes eight people deep. And what was symbolic about this, again, it was somewhat d democratic, uh, it wasn't about an individual person trumping his rival. It was about groups of people trumping their rivals. And so there's something a little bit less of an emphasis on the individual, a little bit more emphasis upon the team. And all of this has some pretty powerful democratic imagery to go with it. So we see, even in the military, a shift to democracy sort of away from aristocracy. Okay, now another thing that's happening during the um, archaic period is, uh, and this red in this map shows you, a greater Greece is forming. And what I mean by that is Greek people, people who are culturally Greek, they speak the language, uh, they are familiar with Homer, they have a similar economy based on um, a common uh, objects of trade. They have similar histories, so on and so forth, similar technologies that they use, architecture, religion. A lot of these things are going to be shared. And what happens is during the Archaic period, due to population increases and similar developments, there's going to be a pressure to expand. And so Greeks build and um, grow outside of the Greek peninsula, and they spread really in all directions. And this is important. It doesn't mean that all these people suddenly had a strong fondness for one another. It's just that they were kind of similar. They saw the world somewhat similarly, and they're going to bring a Greek character to larger and larger portions of the Mediterranean. And it's also worth noting, this will become a little bit something that we take notice of next week when we're studying Rome, a good number of Greeks had settled on the tip 
of the uh, Italian peninsula, and also here in Sicily, the important island off of the Italian peninsula. Okay, so uh, what this means is the Greeks who are learning and practicing the polis and um, or the polis and its various political uh, practices and habits of, of being. Also, they're practicing the military formations of the hoplite phalanx, so on and so forth. All of these things are being exported throughout the Mediterranean, and this is quite important. It's also worth noting that during this colonization phase, when the Greeks are moving to various places and establishing new Greek city-states throughout the Mediterranean, uh, they're also doing this uh, in some ways as a way to get a second start. Uh, in some ways, this is, you can think of this as the United States during the 1800s, uh, when people start spilling out onto the Western Plain, largely because they want a second chance. If you weren't fortunate enough to have land back east, and you didn't have a family name that was the envy of your community, well, you could strike out west and move and hopefully uh, get lucky and establish yourself anew out there. Well, that's a similar phenomenon that's happening during this time. It's also worth noting that there was some frustration. Some people are um, angry because they aren't getting the opportunities that the old families, think of those citizens of the um, uh, polis in Athens. If you're not a member of an old family uh, with some wealth and so on and so forth, you might be uh, might be tough luck for you. So there is some class tension that's taking place alongside this process, which helps to explain the tyrants, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Typically what would happen is the wealthy families of ancient Greece that controlled um, some of the more uh, fertile lands on the Greek peninsula they would be exporting things like wine and olive oil. They might be making pottery. Merchants uh, on the Greek peninsula might be making pottery. So those families are trading. They're making actually quite a bit of money. And they're trading these items out off the Greek peninsula to various places throughout the Mediterranean for things like grains, metals, fish, timber, wheat, slaves, so on and so forth. So there were haves and there were have-nots, which brings us to our final point about the tyrants. Uh, through this process of colonization, what happens throughout the greater Greek world is that uh, merchants, people who are becoming increasingly wealthy, but aren't necessarily receiving opportunity because land is claimed, political power has been owned by some of the more established families, merchants are becoming increasingly frustrated. You could think of this as that generation of um, colonists uh, in the United States early history, sort of pre-United States. People like Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson. These are the people who are educated, they're fairly well off, but they're not getting opportunities to lead because most of the British have sort of held them and kept them in their place. Well, these merchants by the 7th and 6th centuries BC have finally sort of had enough. And so they start um, creating trouble because they want greater opportunity. And they start to overthrow the established power of the leading families in the city states throughout Greece. Here's where tyrants come in. Tyrants are leaders that are just put in power and they're supported largely by this merchant class sometimes members of the lower class who are just fed up and tired of all the same people always having the power. But the tyrants play a critical role. Their name sounds bad, but essentially all they are is people who come to power by non-traditional means. Uh, they aren't subject to the rule of law, but they have a lot of people who are willing to support them. In some ways, Cleisthenes is a good example of one of these tyrants. Okay, So it ends the rule of the aristocratic view and it opens things up it's going to set the stage for democracy because what will happen eventually is uh, the people and this is more the average people but also the merchants of various Greek city-states determine after a time with the tyrants hey you know what we want rule of law we want this all to be legitimate but we don't want to put power back in the hands of the rich families that uh, make life difficult for us so this is essentially the uh, set of circumstances that sets the stage for Greek democracy. And by the late 5th century BC, you will start to see that come into focus. And you'll be reading a little bit about this uh, for tomorrow with the work of uh, Pericles. Okay? I'm going to go post uh, the questions that I told you about in class today momentarily, and they'll be there for you. Enjoy.